This is an interview special with the Athletics Aston Villa reporter, Jacob Tanswell. Jacob, it's great to have you on. You've been producing some absolutely brilliant articles this season. Thank now, you very much for having me. No. no worries at all. No worries. So uh, given it's your uh, first season covering Villa, uh, can you quite believe what's going on at the club at the moment? Do you know, when I first got the job, I was excited to see what would happen to Villa. I knew they were on an upward trajectory. You know, um, they finished seventh. They've had such a great end to the season last year. And I had, you know, I had them in the top six. I thought they could really crack into it, you know, with the struggles of Man United and Chelsea. But if you're asking me whether I expected this good a form, and <laughs> especially after the first day of the season when things started to go a little bit wrong, uh, I could not believe it. And it's just, it's been so good to see. And it's been just a privilege to cover as well. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been supporting Villa literally 30 years now, um, which shows how old I am. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's just it's just an extraordinary time to be a Villa fan. Um, you know, and I guess from your perspective, you know, sort of behind the scenes, I guess, how has Emery achieved this turnaround in Villa's fortunes? You know, he says it a lot, but it's all about consistency and just raising standards. It's not necessarily just within the football department. It's across multiple departments, commercial side, marketing side as well. It's about everyone elevating their own you know, work in a way. You've got the refurbished gym, the new state-of-the-art training grounds, the inner city, inner city academy. It's not necessarily just Emery, but it's everything else. that There's a feeling that everything else has been upgraded and the standards are being there. And you see it with the players as well. The players that have been there for a long time, you thought they had reached their limit. You know, McGinn, Conza, Mings, Cash. But Emery is extracting more out of them every single time. And it's because of the race expectations and the feeling that, you know, if they wanted to be elite, they've got to start thinking like they are. Mm. And is it is it like very, very different to how it was before? You know, I don't want to get at Stephen Gerrard or anything like that, but is it is it just a very different environment to what it was before Emery and since he came in? Yeah, you know, I might be, you know, unfair in saying this because I obviously wasn't covering Villa at the time, so I didn't see what's going on at the time. But if you speak to people that were have crossed over between the two regimes, there's a complete night and day difference. There was an overnight transformation it was described to us, um, not only in the training uh program the contents but within the overall approach as well you know there's a feeling that Gerard um, didn't quite have a structure it was quite shaped at times towards the end he was relying on individual magic uh, and he didn't feel like although you know Perslow and others at the club want it to be a long-term project he just felt like they were just trundling on every week well now there seems to be a project there seems to be a trust there that you know if things aren't going very well there might be a bad runner form you know they're not going to move the owners are going to move Emery's not going to change his principles everything's the same so you either buy into it or you don't I think the players were quite towards the end of Gerard they looked a little bit directionless they didn't have the confidence in Villa in the club but you see with you know the likes of the players that are signing your contracts concert Watkins probably a few more on the way in the next couple of months they believe this is a long-term project with, with a manager that, that they've got full confidence and trust in mm, and you know Emery, we all hear about how meticulous he is and you can really see it on the pitch. I mean, Villa are prepared for games in ways I've never seen, you know, on such a consistent basis as a fan. I just sound in constant bewilderment about what I'm witnessing. But, um, you know, uh, are, are there examples of where Emery, you know, is so driven at training and, um, you know, quite unique as a manager in a way? Yeah, we've written about it um, earlier this week. It's, um, you know, he, he loves obviously his analysis. That's widely known and been repeated multiple times. But, he works you know, 12 hour days at Bonnymore. He, he doesn't go home. He looks for any time to, to do some work, whether it's at lunch, whether it's at breakfast with you know, Monchi and Vidagani, or when he in the afternoon at the refurbished gin, which just overlooks his office. Uh, he goes on a treadmill and takes his laptop onto the treadmills just so he can look at op opposition teams. And you think, if this guy's working this hard, I know a lot of managers obviously work hard, but this guy is obsessed. He's obsessed every day of the week. It consumes him, you know, it consumes him in his personal life, you know, away from work. You know, everything is geared towards improving Aston Villa on the football pitch. Uh, so if you see a guy like him doing that, then players, staff, it probably permeates down to them in terms of trying to match that work ethic. Mm, and can you feel that when you, you know, when you speak to the players um, and those at the club, can you really feel that sort of vibe of real positivity that's just running through them? Yeah, you can. But also at the same time, there's a seriousness to them that, you know, they've, mm. they've beaten Man City and Arsenal. But they're not. You know, obviously, they've taken team photos. They're enjoying the celebrations, but they're not getting carried away. They're, this is they. They expect to be in, in this area. They're not, you know, thinking. Oh my word! You know, we're in a we're in a top four. What do we do? It. You know, they just focus on every single game, getting three points, three points. It's just it's really a traditional mindset. 
it's just about getting through it. You know, they're not going to turn up to Brentford on set on Sunday and just think, oh, we've beaten Man City and Arsenal. We're going to win here. It's a new challenge. It's a different game. And maybe last year, if they'd beaten these two games on the Gerrard, things would start getting a little bit carried away. But Emery keeps their feet on the ground. You see, even in the celebrations, they would just broken a club record. Any other manager probably go on a pitch, you know, lead the celebrations. Emery just walks down the tunnel because he's exhausted, goes to the tunnel, does his media duties, speaks to players, and him done. You know, no big celebrations. Probably already thinking about Zrinski Mostar or something like that. You know, it's just, it's just <laughs> the, the vibe you get from him completely. And, um, you know, I, I, I did really athletic that on the day of the City and Arsenal wins, I mean, truly two of the most incredible back to back victories I've, I've probably ever seen as a Villa fan, really, particularly the City win was that dominance against the Guardiola side was unique in, in history, really. Um, you know, on those days, how did Emery prepare the players for uh, those matches? Yeah, so the Arsenal game was a bit different because they had such a short turnaround. But um, for the Man City game, which is on, on the Wednesday, he needed to drill the extra player, the players more because he had a real set type of game plan. You know, you saw in midfield, Tillemans came in, they essentially played with four centre midfielders because they wanted to overload City in those areas. And in order to do that, they had to make sure that the areas they occupied in possession, exact particularly, uh, they had to get well drilled. Uh, so Emery took as much as he could in terms of the, at the team team in the morning in terms of going to Villa Park early in the morning, uh, doing some walkthroughs on the pitch with a team that's going to start and working on patterns of play and areas where they felt the City were vulnerable and Villa could exploit. And lo and behold, McGinn and Tillemans were arguably the two best players on the day. McGinn, especially first half, you know, ran uh, City ragged, bullied Rico Lewis and Kyle Walker at times. And it's because of the positions he was getting in and how Pau Torres and Luca Dean were, were finding him. And that was all because of the work they did maybe eight hours beforehand on, on the pitch in terms of working through these choreographed patterns of play. Mm. And, um, you know, it's, it's just incredible the sort of work he's putting in and making the players go there to the stadium and sort of rehearse, essentially, almost like for a play. Um, yeah. You know, but, uh, you know... the. Obviously, as Villa fans, we can see on the pitch that how Villa are improving, the, the players, everything is just extraordinary to watch. Um, but kind of behind the scenes, I guess, with like the internal structure uh, around Emery, you know, what what's it like? You know, what who are the key figures involved for him? Yeah, so it's changed since you know Emery was appointed. You had obviously Johan Langer, you had Rob McKenzie leading the scouting and recruitment. Um, since then, it's firmly become Project Emery. You know, he's brought in two dozen you know, Spanish-speaking staff. Uh, everything's geared towards satisfying his needs and a direction that he wants to go in. Uh, the owners, uh, obviously, are behind Emery. Like you wouldn't believe he's got the autonomy that most managers would dream of. And now they form the power triangle. Uh, obviously, with Monchi coming in, who he, you know Emery knows well, and Damian Vidigani, who was, was Emery's personal assistant, and then got promoted to director of football in the summer. Those three share an office with you know, doorway separate in each room. And and they are in charge of all football related decisions. Emery doesn't get involved really in negotiations for players for contracts. He comes in towards the end, towards the finalization. But a bit of Garni Monchi know what Emery wants. So if, as I said at the top, Emery's just solely focused on on the football side, and Monchi and Bidigan, who who basically know what he wants, take care of everything else. You know, speaking to players, making sure they're happy, the agents are happy, letting the players know who can leave. Uh, all these little aspects that a manager might be quite consumed in. You know, Arteta mm. likes to do that type of thing. Emery doesn't. Emery wants to just focus on the football. And that's maybe where he became unstuck at Arsenal. But now at Villa, he's got the men that he trusts in, in there. Uh, and the workers that he you know knows, that, that know what he wants. Uh, and uh, luckily, and you know, through design, it's working an absolute treat. Mm. And, it, you know, when we brought Monchin at the time and Vidigani, I remember I, I said on this podcast that it reminded me uh, a little bit of uh, the setup at um, Man City with uh, Chiki Burgis, Burgiristain and I um, can't remember the other guy now, but the two former Barcelona board yeah. members and people who'd worked with Guardiola before. And that essentially that takes so much pressure off Guardiola and so many other things behind the scenes. And he can focus probably more on the football. And that's, I assume, a, a structure that Villa have maybe looked at and tried to emulate. Yeah, we reported about three weeks ago that Emery, in an ideal scenario, he, the structure he wants and the structure he views as most conducive is Guardiola City. With, if you say, with, with Tetsi and Soriano, these Sorry, guys yeah. that, these guys that Guardiola trusts implicitly, that are really close friends to him, similar to what Vidigani and Monchi are to him, and they know what he wants. So he saw that as the real, the best structure because he wants stability. He wants 
people that he trusts that are going to give him as much stability and a bedrock for his structure and his project almost as possible. So he looks up to Guardiola, Monchi, Vidigani, see Emery as a similar type of manager to Guardiola in terms of how skillful he is, how deeply he thinks about the game. Uh, and it's really important that for obsessive thinkers like Guardiola and Emery, they have people that worked, that knew the inner mechanisms of just his obsession in his mind and having those type of people like at City, something at Villa, in a way, have tried to replicate. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's it's, it's um, again amazing to see not just Villa's uh, on the pitch improvement, but off the field, it feels like things are are very mm. much moving in a positive direction. Um, but do you, uh, you know, looking into January, um, I'm not really sure how much you know any anybody would really know about this. But do you think would there be plans in place for Villa to try and sign somebody, or are are there set ideas about the fact maybe we've got the, the squad we need already? Um, do you know have any intel on that? Emery's happy with the squad he's got. Um, he, he likes to develop relationships with players. He likes them to give them minutes in, in games. You know, he, he said a number of times, he sometimes makes subs to think about the next game. So it's all about developing relationships. So I'd imagine that it's going to largely keep the same. But as history has shown, if Emery wants something, Villa will do their utmost best to do it. So at mm -hmm. the moment, it's a feeling that Villa wants a right back. You know, they have, they've only got one right back in Matty Cash and they need to, probably provide some competition, maybe get someone that's a little bit better in, in offensive areas. Um, so they'll look at that position. At the same time, the FFP uh, area is an elephant in the room. So mm. they need to look at uh, what players does Emery not want and they'll identify it. So you look at uh, Bertrand Traore, Callum Chambers, maybe Dendonka if they're happy with midfield at the moment. And it'll be up to Villagani and Monchi to let their agents, let them know that you, you can go, but let us know what, who who the buyer is and let us know the, the price you want um, because we've got a price and we'll tell you the price and if you can find someone that will match that then you can ha you can go um, so that's really important as well but yeah to answer your question there is scope for Villa to do something but Emery with the rhythm that Villa are in um, will probably wait for the marquee signings in the summer mm. and you know, you know you mentioned the sort of elephant in the room with financial fair play I mean where is there any kind of sense of where Villa are on that or um, do we have to sell to buy or anything like that? No, no not, not necessarily but you have to be mindful so that influence of thinking behind uh, selling these young players in the summer with buyback clauses I think in, in ordinary times they probably would like to keep the likes of Aaron Ramsey Jaden Filigy and Cameron Archer maybe give them another loan uh, but they saw you know if we're not if we don't want to sell one of our marquee players we don't want to sell a Douglas Luiz yet cause that would probably help with RFFB so what we want to do uh, to give Emery what he wants is to you know let these young players go who might be you know not ready yet but they could be ready in two or three years get the money for them bank them as pure profit because they're academy graduates uh, that will help with FFP you know enormously but at the same time just give ourselves a safety blanket in terms of let's have the bite back clause in case they are world beaters but we can have the first option on these guys so I think you know, that they're very mindful of it it's not a case of this is going to creep up on them. They've seen it coming. So I think really there shouldn't be too many drastic measures coming because they've handled it and, and they're aware of it, uh, you know, very ex extensively. Okay. And, um, you know, one factor as well that is changing at Villa in, in the very near future is the North Stand. Obviously that's getting redeveloped and, you know, there's talk of Witten Station as well. Please, please. Can that be approved? Because <laughs> I've seen a lot of keys there for many years. Um, but uh, do you know what the... Um, the latest is on the uh, North Stand redevelopment. Yeah, so we've done a massive piece on it. Um, I want to say three weeks ago, maybe. Um, I've, I spoke to the mayor, um, local councillors, uh, the redevelopment people, uh, Aston Villa, and for them, it's, it's a real tricky situation because the, the as I said, another elephant in the room is Euro twenty twenty eight. I think yeah. maybe if they didn't have that, it would be delayed a little bit because. There's a lot going on. Inflation is going to cost a lot more. Uh, revised plans are not going to have rid of life. All these big ambitions that you know they wanted, you know, I've hit you know a bit of a, a bit of a stumbling block. So they do need to get it done within the next two seasons to have that year, that trial year before Euro 2028, where the new stand is open, it's fully functioning. Um, but in order to do that, they've got to improve the transport links. And right now, there's no money to improve Whistle Station. And if there is, you know from a Aston Villa microcosm, yeah, if they need to upgrade it. But if you're mayor, if you're the new mayor, maybe after the election, you're coming in, you're thinking, hold on, we've got this is going to cost us £30 million pounds to redevelop Witten Station. It rarely gets used anyway, apart from once a fortnight for a match mm. day. Is it worth it or is it better served 
putting that into somewhere else. So although Mayor Mayor Street likes to say that you know there's plans ongoing, he realizes that really uh, in his heart of hearts, this is going to be very difficult to achieve. So yeah, right now it's, there's a lot of complications, a lot more things that need to be ironed out. But hopefully um, things can get underway very soon because it's going to take a couple of seasons to to rebuild the whole block. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it is a bit of a it's an interesting one for sure. I mean, we all want to see Villa Park improve, of course, but it, if the capacity is going up, I mean, the transport has to improve around that the stadium. It just has to. Um, mm. but Jacob, it's been absolutely brilliant to talk to you. Thanks so much. And you know, are you are you looking forward to? Are you going to be getting to the Brentford game? Yep, I'm. I'm missing the first game against uh, my first Villa game against Bosnia. Um, in Bosnia, yeah. sorry. Um, the, the connections and travels is ridiculous, but um, <laughs> yeah, as always, I'll be in at, at Brentford. I'm looking forward to that. I think it's gonna be a great game, and it's gonna be a tough game, isn't it, for Villa? I think hopefully they can improve on recent away games to these type of teams who, of course, a little bit of an issue stylistically, but yeah, the the, the mood and atmosphere around Villa has just been so fun, and yeah, I'm sure it'll continue. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah, Brentford away, it's it's one of the toughest tests in the Premier League. They don't seem to lose at home very often. Um, lost to Arsenal and Everton, I think, is two of their only losses they've really had for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but any, but again, you know, if Villa are in this title challenge, you, you never know, you know, if, if that's what we do, you, you win at places like that, I guess. But, but Jacob, uh, for those who, you know, um, I'm sure many people watching this already follow you and all that, but for those who are only, only perhaps discovering you for the first time, where can we uh, follow you online and uh, find your work? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter, J underscore Tanto. And if you subscribe to The Athletic, I think there's another offer on uh, in, during the Christmas period. Um, it's under the Aston Villa tab uh, on The Athletic. Well, honestly, I can massively recommend that. you've been What you've been doing is brilliant. And uh, long may it continue, honestly. And long may Villa stay good so that the stuff you can write about is positive as well. <laughs> Absolutely. No, my pleasure, mate. Anytime. <laughs>